Today we're going to be continuing our series that we've called Friends Don't Let Friends. And as you know, we've been talking about the true nature of godly friendship. In the first week, we talked about how a friend doesn't let uh, friends don't let friends gossip and complain, because as we know, both of those things are phenomenally destructive. And when someone wants to come to you and begin to gossip or complain, that's always a huge temptation for most of us because we like to be in the know. We want to know the the juicy news and, you know, uh, everything that's going on. But we learn that when somebody comes to us in that situation, we learn three different things that we need to do before we talk with them or before we listen to them. The first one was, anybody remember? The think principle. Everybody remember the think principle? We ask ourselves, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspirational? Is it necessary? Or, and is it kind? And if it doesn't match those criteria, then we have no business talking about it. And then we, uh, as we, after we walk through that, then after that, we ask them the, the simple question of whether or not they have spoken to the person about whom they're gossiping and complaining directly. And if they haven't talked to that person, then the conversation's over. There's nothing we have to talk about until you talk with them and deal with it them uh, individually and, and directly. And then finally, probably my favorite one of all, we ask him, may I quote you on this? Because when you say that, it often ends the issue right there because uh, most gossipers or complainers, uh, especially, you know, if they don't want to be part of the solution, they really don't want to be in the spotlight. They want to hide in secrecy and one of the things we know is that secrecy is not a friend of the truth. And then last week we learned what a, f- a friend would do when he or she sees a friend who is discouraged and who's about to give up too early. Uh, we, we all know life has a way of just crashing down on us and it's easy to begin to get discouraged and, and, and allow despair to begin to creep in. And when we see a friend about to give up, we jump in and we do whatever we can to be a source of encouragement. And we learned last week that it's important to stay connected to God's people because it's very, very difficult to both give or receive encouragement when I separate myself from one of the greatest sources of encouragement that God has given to to me as a believer, and that is the body of Christ. This, when we come together, is one of the biggest sources of encouragement that we have available to us. And when we separate ourselves, when we don't stay connected to the body of Christ, then we separate ourselves from the encouragement, but we also separate ourselves from being able to encourage someone else. And we learned that to be an encourager, that I have to choose my words wisely because my words have great power and therefore my words have great consequences. And our words can be used to either discourage our friends or they can be used to encourage them. And we learn that an encourager looks for the best in his or her friends. And he sees them the way that God sees them, loaded with spirit-empowered potential. And we learn that if we're going to be effective encouragers, then we have to live it ourselves. we got to lead by example. Today we're going to be talking about a new subject. It's, It's actually, in a way, it's somewhat similar to what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about friends don't let friends give up. Today, we're going to learn that friends don't let friends go. Friends don't let friends go. Last week, we were dealing with a friend who is discouraged. This week, it's somewhat similar, but it's a little different because we're going to learn how to act, what we should do when a friend is wandering away from God, when they're making wrong choices, when they're beginning to dabble in sin, and you see that in their lives. And how do we handle that? How do we do deal with that? How many of you here are uh, old enough to remember the old, uh, 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 it's now Life Alert. They had a different name back then. I can't remember what it was. But how many remember the old commercial where there's the elderly lady that's lying on the ground is a really, really terrible actress, I'm sorry to say. You know, and she says, help, I'm falling and I can't get up. How many of you remember that? A lot of you remember that. You're old people. But uh, I, do, I remember it too. But that phrase became part of a vocabulary and we laughed about it. It was, it was even included in all kinds of different sitcoms. I saw a clip where Steve Urkel said it. How many, you remember Steve Urkel, right? If, if you don't remember Steve Urkel, you're not my people. That's all I can say. But, uh, in, in, in it was, you know, it was just this funny thing, this, this punchline we had, but the truth is when we're dealing with something like what we're talking about today, then it's not very funny at all. 
Because there are times when we falter, when, when our friends falter in, in, in their walk with God, and, when, and there are times when we just can't seem to get back on track by ourselves. There are times when we need the help of a friend to climb out of a pit of our own making. Anybody here ever made your own pit? Uh, let me see your hand. I want to see. Okay, yeah. yeah that, was, that was as close to unanimous as I'm ever going to get on anything, I think. Yeah, yeah. We do that sometimes. We create, we dig our own pit, and sometimes we dig it so deep that we need somebody else to help us get out. And as we continue to talk about the nature of true Christian friendship, today we're going to be answering the age-old question, one of the oldest questions in all of human history. The question is, am I my brother's keeper? You remember that, that, that question when Cain asked uh, God, uh, Cain, uh, God was speaking to Cain and, and, uh, and, and God said, hey, Cain, where's your brother? Which, by the way, remember this. When you see God ask a question in Scripture, it's not because he needs the answer. He knows the answer. He's trying to get Cain to confess what he has done. He's trying to get Cain to, to see where he is and what's going on. So he says, Cain, where's your brother? And, and Cain's uh, 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 question to God in response was, how am I supposed to know? Am I my brother's keeper? Is it my job to look out for him? If you can't find Abel, then, then it's his own fault. But the answer to the question, biblically speaking, is yes, you are your brother's keeper. We have a responsibility to those we call friends. We have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when, when a Christian sees a friend wandering down a pathway that leads to destruction, he or she has a relational responsibility to do everything possible to stop his or her friend from taking that path. But I think the question before us, because a lot of us would agree with that. A lot of us would say, yeah, I get that. I agree with that. But the question is, how do we do that? How, do, how should we approach a friend who is beginning to wander in their walk with God? What, what do we do when a friend is getting caught up in, in a web of sin? Well, unfortunately, more often than not, the way most of us deal with it is we just ignore it. We just don't want to deal with it. We don't want to bring it up. We, and we've all been guilty of that. I've been guilty of that in my lifetime. You know, maybe we're afraid that somebody's going to get upset if we bring, bring it up and we talk to them. We're afraid that, well, if I do that, maybe they'll just leave the church altogether. I don't know what's going to happen. And we fall prey to what we have discovered is one of the greatest idols in the American church. We fall prey to the idol of friendship and we fail to do what God's word says we should do in a situation like that. And when a friend is wandering away, from God, we have to remember, friends don't let friends go. Friends don't let friends go. A true friend doesn't ignore the need to pursue those who are drifting away or, or those that have separated themselves from the body of Christ. When, when we see a friend losing his or her way, we need to remember that a wandering friend needs help, whether they want to admit it or not. How many of you have ever known somebody that wouldn't admit they need help? Every wife in this building is, is nodding their head right now. I'm just, I know, I know, I know, I get it. But a wandering friend needs help. Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes this. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Now, it, it talks about someone being caught in a sin there in that first verse. And that word caught was used to describe a bird or an animal that had become entangled in some sort of trap. That's the word that's used. And, and so what happens is this. There, there's, there's an illusion of freedom that, that is put before us. And what we're talking about here is someone where the illusion of freedom has lured someone into the trap of being a slave to self or a slave to sin. That's exactly what happened in the story of the prodigal son. Everybody here I know remembers that. You've heard the story of the prodigal son and how it started out with the, the, the youngest son went to the father and demanded his portion of the inheritance before he died. I don't know about you. Can you even imagine that? Can you imagine your child coming to you and saying, hey, dad, 
why should I have to wait for you to die to enjoy my inheritance? So I'm going to ask you to do one of two things, Dad. Would you just die now so I can have it or just give it to me in advance if you're not willing to, you know, if you're so selfish you don't want to die for me now, just give me the money now. And so, you know, it's just, it's just a shocking request that this young man is, is, makes of his father. And amazingly, the father gives him the money and the son goes out and he just has the most uproarious time. I mean, it's the best time ever. He, he wastes his money on, on wine and women. He, he wastes his money. We know later from the, from the chapter of the story. Uh, of, of the prodigal. We know he wasted on prostitutes. He, 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 his mo- money just pours from his coffers like water over a waterfall. And he drinks in every moment of his immoral and riot, riotous, riotous uh, lifestyle. And he's just having the best time of his life. He cannot imagine that life could ever be so much fun until he runs out of money. You remember that moment? And after he runs out of money, one of the things I know, the Bible doesn't say it explicitly, but one of the things I know that happened is after he ran out of money, all of his so-called friends don't want anything to do with him anymore. Has that ever happened? You ever seen that happen? How do I know that? Well, because he's hungry and nobody helps him pay for his meals. Even though, even though he had treated, last night he treated all of his friends to steak and lobster, now when he's hungry, nobody wants to help him. Though, though uh, they won't, don't want to pay for his liquor, even though he set up the house with drinks night after night after night, they, they don't provide a place for him to lay his head at night, even though he spent all of his money to accommodate their pleasure. He's suddenly alone. He's completely destitute. He's no place to lay his head, no food to eat, and he's facing imminent starvation. So he does the absolute unthinkable for a, a young Jewish man. He finds the only job that's available, feeding pigs. Now I know it's the only job available because no Jewish man would ever willfully associate himself with raising pigs because pigs were considered unclean animals by religious law and they were not supposed to have anything to do with him. So this young man, as we see now, has sunk from the highest highs to the lowest place imaginable imaginable for a Jewish man. And he's sitting there and he's trapped in a pigsty with no place to go. And he is so hungry that he looks on the slop that the pigs are eating with envy. Have you ever seen what pigs eat? Anybody here ever seen what pigs eat? I'm telling you, you got to be pretty hungry to look at that and say, oh mm, boy, I wish I had some of that. I'm telling you, you got to be desperate to look at the slop that pigs eat and say, wow, you know, just one plate? How about one plate? And, and, and not only that, I also know this. I also know that he stinks to high heaven from this melo, melo, melodorous, putrid odor of the pigs. Anybody ever driven past a pig farm? Listen, I thought I had smelled bad. Th- I used to live in Dodge City, Kansas, and there's these feedlots out there. And, you, and the wind goes the wrong way. I'm telling you, it is so nasty. But then I drove past pig farms in Iowa. And I thought I was going to throw up. I tried to hold my breath for like 20 miles. It didn't work. But it was so bad. It was unbelievable. So I know this guy stinks to high heaven on top of that. So all that to say this. Here's what I want you to see. What appeared to be a path to freedom actually led him to a place of despair and ruin. When he was living it up and enjoying the pleasures of sin for a, for a season, I am absolutely certain that he thought he had found some freedom. I'm sure he thought to himself, man, this is the life. I'm free from the rules of that old man. I'm free from having to go to church with him every week. I'm, 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 I'm free from getting up at the crack of stupid to go take care of that God-forsaken patch of earth that he calls a farm. I don't have to do things when he wants them done. I don't have to do things he wants them done. Finally, I can do whatever he wants. And he pulled a brave heart and said, freedom! However, what appeared to be freedom as he pursued his sinful appetites was actually nothing more than a lure, nothing more than bait 
to lead him into a trap of sin where he would find agony and despair. No freedom. Here's what I want you to understand. When selfishness is pursued in the name of freedom, the end is always agony and despair. And that's why sin is so deceptive. That's how the enemy fools so many people into pursuing things that will actually destroy them and destroy their families and destroy everything they love in this lifetime. He, he disguises it as freedom when the truth is it's nothing more than bait to try to get them to swallow the hook. So Paul's talking about a believer who has fallen for the lie that there's freedom, they can be free from all of these things and free from God and free from His rules. And now they've been entrapped with no hope of escape. That's that's what it means to be caught. But it also says they're caught in something. He talks about them being caught in sin. Now the word sin in verse 1 indicates the idea of stumbling or or sliding off of a slick path. How many of you have ever, ever slipped on ice? That ever happened to you? Some of the funniest videos to watch are ones that you also want to cringe. It's like, I hope they're not hurt, but that was really funny, is watching them slide. I remember one time, uh, and I've shared this story uh, in past. I don't think I've ever shared it here, but, but uh, I'm, I'm going to tell a story about my wife. We, and we, were, we were, went with some friends to uh, San Francisco when we were living in Reno, Nevada. And this was not very long after Aaron had been born. And we, we went over there and make, I don't need to go into all the details, but we, we went and we took a ferry ride across the bay there. And we were walking down from the pier where the bay, where the ferry landed down to pier 39, where there's some great clam chowder, some of the best you'll ever have there. Anyway, we're walking along and, and I, I got this backpack baby carrier on and Aaron's in there and she's, you know, they're sitting there bouncing along and, and uh, our, our friends also had a baby and they had another one and, and her dad was carrying her on the back the same way. And we're walking along and, and as we're going along, G- Julie is, then, is walking next to me and she's like every good mom, she's playing with the baby, you know, just talking with her, having a good time, enjoying her and, and Aaron is enjoying the interaction and all this stuff. And as we're walking along, and I have to be careful because if I go too far, I know it got out of the frame and the people in the live stream are like, where'd it go? But we're walking along and, and so we're going and Julie's talking and playing. And next thing we know, it's like, Julie's like, Boom! and she's just gone. And what happened was, as she was watching us and when playing with Aaron, she didn't see that they built these crazy cement benches right in the middle of the sidewalk and she walked right into it and went face down right on the right on the the bench there and and she was just gone now she was didn't get hurt or anything and she was laying there laughing and there was a car parked here and they were enjoying it and there was a jogger that was going by he's like oh that was a good one there you know it's all and you, you can ask her this is all all true it's 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 a very funny story but 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 that's a, that's a lot like what we're talking about here that that he a believer for, for one reason or another, gets his eyes in the wrong place and is suddenly tripped up by sin and now they're lying on the ground for everybody else to see. A good example of this is Peter. Peter boasted that he would never abandon Jesus. How do you remember that? He said, Lord, I don't know about all these other disciples. I don't know what they'll do, but I'm here to tell you, I'll never, I'll never forsake you. Yet he ended up denying Jesus three times in a row in one night during Jesus' trial. You know know what happens uh, when people fall into sin? We we need to understand this. They they don't fall into sin out of nowhere. They begin to wander. Maybe Maybe they get, like I said, they get their eyes in the wrong place. They begin to stray just a little bit. They begin to test the boundaries and then nothing terrible happens. So they push things a little bit further and then eventually they take one step too far and they find themselves trapped in some snare of sin and then they don't know how to get out. They don't know what to do. They they think they've gone so far that they can't come back. Oh, I've betrayed Jesus. I'm not worthy. I, I can't possibly face the church again knowing that they know what I've done and where I've been. Well, listen, that friend, that person needs to know that there's a godly friend who does not excuse their sin, but loves them all the way through it. Loves them in spite of it. 
They need to know that there's a friend who hasn't given up on them even when they've given up on themselves. They need to know that there is a way back home. They need to know that there is hope. They need to know that they can come back home and a, and a true godly friend will be the first one there with hand outstretched saying, yes, you can come home. I'll walk with you. Uh, let, let's walk this thing back in repentance. Jesus hasn't ab abandoned you or given up on you and I'm not going to abandon you or give up on you. See, a real friend reaches out to help restore a straying friend. Uh, and, and it talks about in Scripture, maybe your translation says something like that. It says that the one who is spiritual should restore such a one. Well, the, the, the person best equipped to, to help a fallen follower is one who is spiritual. Now, that doesn't mean the way we use it a lot of times. You know, down south, we're not talking about somebody who is spiritual. You know what I'm talking about? So, you know, they're, they're, they're just so spiritual, so heavenly minded that they're no, no earthly good kind of thing where, where they just put on this air like they're better than everybody else. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about here is simply who's living a normal, spirit-filled Christian life. That's what it means. You don't, you don't have to be a super saint to help bring healing to broken people. Thank goodness for that. Because I, I, I'm not a super saint and I haven't met any in my, well, I may have met a couple, uh, a couple come to my mind, but there aren't very many of them around. But, but spiritual people are just simply, they're ordinary people who are relying on an extraordinary God. The, the one who has fallen is in need of rest, restoration. What, one thing they don't need, and kind of covered this a couple weeks ago, is they don't need criticism or gossip. You know, you know, the word restore that he uses here, it means to make something right by bringing it back to its former condition. The, the word was, was commonly used for setting a, a broken bone. You know, when a bone is broken, it's out of alignment, they have to get it set and get it right in place so it will heal properly. That's the word that it's talking about. It's also used in Matthew 4.1 to describe the mending of a torn net. So it's something that is broken, something that is out of place. And it's talking about the process whereby healing comes or restoration comes to make it like it was before. In other words, restoration is an essential part of the healing process. And if someone has experienced dislocation from the body of Christ or brokenness in their life or has been torn apart by sin, he or she needs someone who will come alongside of them in order to help put things back in place to bring healing into their lives. Because here's what we have to understand. God is in the restoration business. Thank God for that. He is in the restoration business. Ezekiel 34 verse 16 says, I will, this is God speaking, I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. God works to bring sinners to wholeness. And you know what the amazing part is? He usually uses, he usually works through a believer. Now, there are times when God moves and he saves and he heals and he does things on his own. But most of the time when God moves, it's in response to a believer moving in obedience to him. For example, somebody who gets saved off the street. It's not usually that they're walking along and all of a sudden an angel appears, you know, or some bolt of lightning hits them and they get saved. It usually happens. What happens is some believer goes to them and tells them about Jesus and they, and they see the truth of the gospel and they respond to the pull, the, the, the pulling on the, the uh, conviction of the Holy Spirit and they give their lives to Christ. You see, God will do these things but he usually works his normal manner. He can do anything. He can work outside, but the normal way he works is through you. It's through the church. In fact, that's why this church's, church's name is Restoration Life Church, because that's what we're about. That's why we exist. We want to be about God's business of restoring men and women who are lost and broken in their sin to the full life that God desires for them and that Jesus offers to them. And if we are not actively looking for ways to bring back those who are spiritually sidetracked, then how are they ever going to get back on their feet? How will they ever wake up and see 
where, where, that, they're, that they're on the wrong pathway. Jude chapter, not chapter, there's only one chapter in Jude. Jude verses 22 and 23 says, show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Boy, that's the opposite of what we do a lot of times. A lot of times somebody's faith is wavering. That's the point where a lot of Christians will attack. Like, oh, come on, get your act together. That's not what he says. Show mercy to those whose faith is wa wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. The words of James 5, 19 and 20, both challenge and, 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 and uh, comfort me at the same time. So this is what he says. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. You know what I think we have to ask ourselves? Ask yourself this question. Who does God want to restore through me? Who does God want to restore through me? Is there anyone that you can think of right now who is just going down this slippery pathway of sin? Who do you know that, that has grown cold toward God and is caught up in a trap of sin? As you look around in church today, who isn't here that should be? Who has gone missing for no good reason? Who used to be a part of this body and now there's this gaping hole where they used to be simply because they've wandered off and fallen into some pit of sin. I want you to understand this. Jesus put you in their life for a reason. And it's not someone else's job. You know, the reason so many things go left undone in the church today, not just the church, this is really everywhere in our culture, our culture. The reason so many things go left undone is because we waste time thinking that someone else should do it. I want you to understand this. If God has brought a name into your mind today, at this very moment, it's because he wants you to reach out to them. So if I ask that question to say, who isn't here that should be here? Who is wandering down the path of sin? And a name came to your mind, a face came to your mind. I want you to understand that is the call of the Holy Spirit to you. That's God saying to you, you need to do something. You need to reach out. Don't leave it to somebody else. Don't, don't just say, well, I hope somebody tells them. I hope somebody reaches out to them. God wants you to be a part of what he's trying to do in their life. He wants you to be a true friend to them. He wants you to use you, as, as Corinthians says, as a minister of reconciliation. He wants you to, uh, he, he, he wants to bring them home and he's trying to send you as an emissary of peace to them. And that leads us to the question that may be running through your mind right now. Okay, all right, I get that. I know that God wants me to be the kind of person that reaches out to those who are wandering. He wants me to be that kind of a godly friend. And, and somebody is coming to my mind and there's somebody I know I need to reach out to, but how? How, what do I do? How do I approach a wandering friend? Well, I want to give you a couple things. The first thing, is kind of the foundation of all of it. What under, underlies everything is that you approach the person who is wandering with gentleness and with humility. That is so important. You touch them with kindness and with tenderness. In doing so, we're, we're actually reflecting the heart of our God. Listen to what the tenderness in these passages, 2 Timothy 2.25, 2, gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Romans 2, 4, surely you know that God is kind because he's trying to lead you to repent. Another translation of that says it's, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. In dealing with other people's sins, however, we often end up being more judgmental than gentle. It happens a lot of times. When, when we see someone sl slipping into sin, the first thing we need to, need to do is we, we should pause and we need to ask the Lord to keep us safe from the sins that slip us up. That's the first thing we need to do. That's, and that's a sign and an act of humility. Uh, we, we, we read that. We'll come back to that. But that's the very first thing we should do. We, we should humble ourselves 
and recognize that we are not better, we are not stronger, we are not holier than they are, we are just as prone to wander as they are, we all stumble and fall, we all sin. And we're just as sinful and broken as the friend we're trying to reach. The only difference is that we're walking in the grace that we have found in Christ that heals us. James 3.2 says this, we all stumble in many ways. Let me just ask you to take a little survey, do a little math test. Um, if we all stumble in many ways, how many people do not stumble in many ways? The answer is zero. John, 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin. Now remember, John is writing to a church. He's writing to Christians. He's not writing to unsaved people. He says, if we say, as Christians, if we say we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. See, when we forget that we are frail human beings that are prone to stumbling into sin, then what happens is our hearts begin to go, grow proud. We begin to develop the spiritual pride in us. And what happens then is we see somebody else's sin and we begin to say, well, I would never... I would, I would never. And we, we get all upset and angry and self-righteous over this terrible, egregious sin that somebody else has committed. You know what we're doing when we, when we do that in light of what we just read in Scripture? What we're doing is we're getting angry and judgmental with them, not because they've sinned, but we're getting angry and judgmental with them because they dared to sin differently than we do. You ever thought of it like that? That's, that's like a rapist looking down in judgment on a murderer. Well, I would never murder, so somehow I must be better than you. No, the rapist has lost the right to judge other people's crimes because they both have no regard for human life or the well-being of other people, and they both were willing to go to extremes to get what they wanted no matter what it costs their victim. We have to remember that although your friend may have sinned in a different way than you, than you have, that you're still just a sinner who is found and is walking in the grace of Jesus. You're still a person who is lost and broken in sin and Jesus found you. You didn't find Him. He found you. He saved you and He healed you and is in the process of healing you. When you know that, when you have that in your mind, what happens is then you can approach your wayward friend with gentleness and humility because you know that you need forgiveness. Probably every day. Anybody on the same page with me? And we will remain gentle and humble when we remember that we're all broken people. That we're all sinners. It's just that some of us have been saved by Jesus. We're all wounded healers is another way to say it. God wants to bring healing to other people's lives. And he's going to use you even though you have been wounded in the past. Gentleness is born out of a sense of our own weak and wandering hearts. Because it's, very, it's a lot easier to be gentle and humble with somebody when I realize I was just as lost and broken. That I'm no better. I'm no different. Restoration is delicate and messy work. And I'm here to tell you, it is not for those who feel spiritually superior. It, 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 it's difficult to know how to respond when a brother or sister falls. But I'm going to give you, that's the foundation. That's the attitude you approach. Now I'm going to give you four things to keep in mind as you approach a wandering friend, okay? You might want to write some of these down. Four things to keep in mind as you approach a wandering friend. Number one, don't diminish the seriousness of sin. Don't pretend that it's not as bad. Don't go to them and say, oh, well, you know, that's not that bad of a sin. You can, you know, it's okay. We should not excuse or ignore sin. That's, Jesus never did that. He never, when he, when he spoke with somebody who was a sinner in, in the New Testament, when you read it in the Gospels, he never looked at them and said, oh, yeah, it's all right. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. That's not a big deal. No, what, what he did, he, he did what the same thing with all of them the, with the, that he did for the woman who was caught in adultery in John chapter 8. We all know that story. She was caught in adultery, caught in the act. They bring her before Jesus, and they're ready to stone her, which is the what the law required. 
And they tell Jesus, hey, what do you say? Should we stone her? And they thought, man, we got him now because we know if he says stone her, the, the people are not going to like that. And, and, but, but then if, 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 uh, if he, if he, uh, doesn't, then we got him because he's being disobedient to the law. And, you know, Jesus told the story. He said, he said, well, all right. Uh, I tell you what, those of you who have no sin, you be the first one to, th- to throw the first stone. You started off if you got no sin. The Bible says they walked off from the oldest to the youngest. And then he turned to the woman who had been caught in adultery. No question about her guilt. She had been caught in the act. But he said, and he told her, your sins are forgiven. But that's that's not where he ended, is it? He said in verse 11, go now. And leave your life of sin. He didn't say, listen, I've forgiven you. So now, you know, anytime you sin, you just come and ask forgiveness and I'll, we'll deal with it then. He said, no, you got to quit that. You got to walk away from that. Remember that, that the sin will destroy the life of, of your friend. And, and, and that's what you want to avoid. So don't write it off. Don't minimize it. Treat it for what it really is. It's spiritual cancer and it will kill them. So that's number one. Don't diminish the seriousness of the sin. Number two, avoid the temptation to witch hunt. I'm I'm here to tell you this. With this message, no one is asking, asking you to go on a search and destroy mission to uncover and correct the sins of other people. That's not what this is about. We have enough spiritual terminators. I mean, you're going to see the movie The Terminator. You know what I'm talking about? So we have enough spiritual terminators walking around, you know, you know, hunting people down with sin and, you know, I'll be back, you know, that kind of stuff. That, that's not, they just blow things up and they never bring any restoration or healing. We don't need any spiritual uh, trophy hunters looking for heads to mount on their walls. You know, see that one there? Uh, I caught him lying, so I nailed him, you know. And, and that one there? Well, she was caught messing around with drugs, so you know she had to go. You know, and those two, well, they were caught in adultery, so definitely had to be put down. On that guy there, well, honestly, I just didn't like him. You know, <laughs> yes. and it's we got enough of that. We don't need that. No, 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 no. You're not on a mission to expose everybody's sin, just for the sake of embarrassing them, and for the sake of making yourself appear more righteous. You're you're on a mission to restore. You're not you're not hunting them. You're like more like the shepherd trying to find the lost sheep to bring him home. Number three, this is important. Watch yourself to avoid falling into sin. That's what Paul said when we read it at the very beginning in Galatians chapter 6. He said, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. That was in verse 2. You, now, that can mean two different things. You may be tempted with the very same sin that trapped your friend. You know, our our attempts to help a friend in Christ out of their pit could be the occasion of our own falling, you know, where, you know, juicy details of sinful acts and emotional ties and physical contact and meditation on sin could draw us into the same sin as well if we're not careful. And and as we uh, help someone out of the pit, we have to make sure we don't allow them to pull us down with them. But but there's also, I want you to understand this, that's not necessarily what he's all he's saying. He's not just saying... Watch out because you might fall into the same sin. He just said, or you may fall into sin. Because that's not the only sin that you have to guard against. In fact, that's probably less uh, of a risk than than the the temptation to become proud and self-righteous. Galatians 6.3 says, if someone thinks, we just read this, if someone thinks he or she is somebody when really they are nobody, They are deceiving themselves. We have to be careful not to become a a self-righteous judge. And if you think you're better than others, then I'm here to tell you, you are deceived and you really are not qualified to help any person out spiritually. A a self-righteous friend, a self-righteous person cannot help a wandering friend until he or she gets the sin of self-righteousness out of his, his or her own life. That's the principle Jesus talked about in Matthew 7. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. 
First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Then the fourth thing, this is the overriding of all. Remember that the goal is restoration. The goal is to restore their relationship with God and to restore them to the body of Christ. That's the goal of everything. And you have to keep that in mind. That the goal is not just to be a friend. The goal is not just to look good. The goal is not to just have them look at you and say, well, you know, they're really a good person. They've never given up on me. The goal is to get them to look past you and and see that Jesus is there waiting for them to come home. You know, the thing is, punishment looks backward to the offense. But restoration puts the person back on the path that leads forward. That's our goal. Our goal is not to try to punish them, not to try to make them, you know, do penance for their sin or anything. Our goal is simply to get them back on the path moving forward in their walk with God. And while you can't diminish the sin, you also have to focus on the fact that God has not given up on that person. Thank God for that. I thank God that He doesn't give up on people easily because Years and years ago, he would have given up on me. But we have to learn to, how many of you, I I want to introduce a new word. Maybe you've heard it before. It's not a real word, but it will be because that's the wonderful thing about English is you can make up words. Um, but, But we don't like the idea of confronting somebody. Well, we have to learn to care front our Our friends. We need to learn to care front our friends with the goal of bringing them back to God. Where we deal with the issue, but we do it with a heart full of love and humility and gentleness. The objective is always to restore them and to their relationship with God and to restore them to the body of Christ. Restoration, if you get anything, get this, restoration is the process of taking a wayward brother or sister by the hand and humbly and gently leading them back to the master's table. That's what it is. On February 24th, 2001, a one-year-old Canadian girl named Erica somehow wandered out of her mother's bed and house and spent the entire night in the Edmonton winter. When the mother, Layla Nordby, found her, Erica appeared to be totally frozen. Her legs were stiff, her body frozen. All signs of life appeared to be gone. Erica was treated at Edmonton's Stollery Children's Health Center, and God did a miracle and and used the doctors, and somehow he brought her back to life. And, And it was an absolute miracle. To the amazement of all, there appeared to be no sign of brain damage and doctors gave Erica a clear prognosis that she would soon be able to hop and skip and play like all the other girls her age. You know what? Some have wandered away from our father's house and has brought them to a place, a point of near death. Their hearts are hardened. Their spiritual bodies look as lifeless as the little girl lying in the snow but the father's trying to bring them home because he can take their lifeless spirits and restore them to health. And the amazing thing of all of that is he wants to use you to do it. A friend doesn't just let a wandering friend go without doing everything in his or her power to rescue that person from certain destruction. The body of Christ must be continually reaching out to those who are wandering away from from God. Do do you know someone who is wandering? Is there someone you need to call this week? Is there someone you need need to send a card to, a text to, to begin to open up a conversation, to make sure that they know that you're here, that you haven't forgotten them, that you're still praying for them, and that, that there's always a door open for them to come home. There's always a door open for them to return to Jesus. There's always the, uh, the door open at the church, and the arms of Restoration Life Church are wide open to receive them but you have to start that conversation somewhere is there someone who needs you to be a real godly friend let's learn to be the body of Christ 
and reach out to those who may be wandering away from the Father. Because as I said, God is in the restoration business. He's in the restoration business. He does not give up on us even when we grieve Him. He does not stop loving us even when we can't carry our load. He pursues us even when we shake our fist at the air and scream in defiance in our pain. He pursues us when we're proud. No matter how far we stray, He still wants to restore us. And not only does He want to, He has the power to restore us. He wants to use you. If there's anything that you get from this short series of messages, it's this, that God wants to use you. He's given you your friendships strategically on purpose. He's put you in the lives of people on purpose. The friends that you have are not by accident. Even the ones, by the way, oh, this is the one that really gets me. Even the ones that drive you crazy. How many of you have people in your life that just drive you nuts? And it's not that you don't like them. Maybe you don't like them, but I don't know. But, but, but they just drive you crazy. And some of you are like pointing at your spouse right now, but that's, that's not what I'm talking about there. Uh, but, but, but those people are put there by God. And, and he's put them in your life for two reasons. One, because he's going to use them to shape you. Which, by the way, those people that aggravate you are the ones that God uses to shape you the most like Jesus. But he's also put you in, in their life because he wants to use you to touch them. So keep your eyes open. Pay attention to what God's doing around you. When you see somebody and you begin to see signs that maybe they're wandering, go, go take them out. Get a, get a cup of coffee if you drink coffee or, or a, a Coke if you drink Coke or, or a tea or one of these health drinks. I don't even know what they are. Whatever you do, you just go out and get, get something. Get a donut. That's safer. Just do that. And, and just go sit down with them and just, just say, hey, are you Okay. I just sense that there's a distance here. I sense that maybe you're wandering a little bit. Are you okay? I want you to know I'm here. I'm, I'm a safe place. I love you. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. Would you bow your head and pray? Father, it's so amazing to me that you would choose to use us to be involved in your ministry of reconciliation. But yet you've called us into that. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, to, to realize that and to, to see that the friendships that you've given to us are not just a gift for us to, that we can receive a benefit from, but Lord, they're also given to us as tools whereby we can reach out and we can touch other people and we can influence them toward Christ and we can be there for them in the same way we need them to be for us. And Lord, I pray that today, Lord, that you would help us. Lord, if there's somebody that you've laid on our heart, if there's a name that has come to our mind, Lord, help us just to be faithful to follow through on that. And, and I know, Lord, it's a little scary for us because we don't know how they're going to react, but, but you don't call us to worry about the things that we can't control. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us just to be obedient and reach out to them, whether it's or whether we start the conversation with a card or a text or a phone call or maybe even a short conversation. But God, I just pray you'd help us to be obedient. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that's, or maybe they're on the live stream, that, they're, that they are wandering, I pray God that they would hear the message today that the door is open. And that Jesus, you have, you're not looking down on them saying, I, 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 can, they, I don't want them back, but you're saying, come home. There is forgiveness. There is reconciliation. There is restoration. Come home. And I pray, Lord, that they would walk through that door without fear. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, and there's nobody looking around. I, I don't know where anybody is, but the first thing I want to do is I want to know if maybe there's somebody here that you... You, you look at your life and you say, you know what, I, I'm kind of one of those people. I've been wandering. I haven't been living for Jesus. I've been walking away. I haven't been doing the right things. And, 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 I, and maybe you've been afraid to come home to Him. Today, I want to just open the door and just say, Jesus is there and, he's, and His arms are wide open and He's saying, come home, come home. 
Come home. Come be part of the body of Christ. Come back to me. Let me restore you. You you can't do it on your own. Just come home to me. And if that's you today, and you say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I'm ready to come home. Would you slip your hand up right where you are? Is there anybody? Maybe you're on the live stream. You can just make a comment and just say, yeah, pray for me. But I want to give you that opportunity before we do anything else. Is there anybody? Second thing, Dan. I think there's probably people in this room that a name came into your mind when we were talking today and there's someone you're thinking about. The amazing thing is, it's probably the way the Holy Spirit works is that there's probably multiple people thinking about one or two in, in, in individuals and multiple people will reach out to them and it's going to have such an impact on them. But I'm just going to ask you, I want to pray for you. If, let, let me just ask this. If, if there's somebody here and you say, Pastor, pray because God's laid somebody on my heart and I need to reach out to them. Would you slip your hand up right where you are? Yeah. Okay. There's several hands up. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you that the Lord will go before you. Okay. And everybody here, you agree with me. Let's pray for one another that God would use this body to bring reconciliation. Father, you saw these hands and, and Lord, you, you already know because you laid them on our hearts. You brought them to our minds. And Lord, I pray, first of all, God, for a spirit of humility and, and, and humbleness, a, a meekness, Lord God, that would rest upon your people. And Lord God, that as we walk in obedience, as we begin to reach out to those that are, that are hurting, those that are wandering, those that are dabbling in sin, those that are walking down a path that, that we can see is going to lead them to destruction. God, I pray you'd help us to have the courage to step out and to, and to reach out to them and to talk with them, to initiate that conversation. And God, that I pray that in that process, Lord God, that you would, you would just go before them that you would prepare the hearts, that you would make them hungry, Lord, that they'd be ready to hear what you want to say. And God, I pray that you would help us to have the patience that we need to be there, to continually reach out and always to make sure they know the door is always open. You can always come home. Jesus is all, always waiting for you. His arms are open wide. Come home, repent, and, and, and let him change your life. And so God, I pray that you would just go before us. And all those names, all those people, as, as you work on their hearts, God, I pray that we begin to see miracles take place. And Lord, I pray for an anointing on your people, uh, an anointing for reconciliation. I pray, God, that you would uh, give us a spirit of love and compassion as we reach out to those that are struggling. And I thank you for what you're going to do. And Lord, I pray as we leave this place that even today, God, that you would open doors, help us to touch the lives of people with whom we come in contact. Lord, that you would use us. We're part of your body. Use us to reach out to this world. And we pray it all in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.